Hello there and welcome to the final session of this course, The Tyranny of Oneness. Now, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I just want to start uh, the seminar by kind of going across what we've been doing through each seminar. And then today we're going to delve into the question of how we actually set up communities that can uh, embrace the contradiction and turn it into something useful and good. And I'm going to connect that directly with actually the meaning of religion. Uh, the word religion can mean many different things. Uh, it's hard to pin down. But in the context of this seminar, what I mean by religion is simply uh, our relationship to the absolute. Uh, religion, in a way, is there to connect us with uh, or explore our relationship to the absolute. So I'm going to delve into what that means in more depth. But first of all, where we've gone so far, what terrain have we covered? Uh, in the first seminar, basically that was just laying the groundwork, talking about the idea of contradiction as part of reality, that we initially encounter contradiction as a contingency that attacks us from outside, a contingency that we can get rid of, but that as we uh, systematically and deeply work through the contradictions of our lives, whether they are at a subjective level or in the area of science or in the area of politics, what we find is deeper and deeper contradictions, higher contradictions. And eventually, uh, what we will discover is that we move basically from the idea that life has contradictions to the position in which life is a contradiction that there is something about deadlock, about lack, uh, about um, antagonism that is inherent within reality, which actually, in fact, uh, is the reason why there is reality, why there is anything at all. That conflict isn't some contingent thing, it's necessary. So of course, we can think about evolutionary, uh, evolutionary biology. Um, uh, for someone who is a, you know, a confessional Christian, um, in a, say, a fundamentalist setting, evolution does create a fundamental problem. Uh, not, not primarily because of it's, uh, it goes against something within the Bible or anything like that, but if you think about it, evolutionary biology seems to imply or does imply that violence um, and destruction are inherent to creation, to being. And immediately you get the sense in which that does contradict a notion in which uh, violence and destruction um, is contingent, something that entered into reality but can be got rid of. So in, a, in a, you know, a very serious way, it is actually a threat to a certain way of seeing the world. And we can often um, get caught up in the weeds of kind of creation scientists who are, who are trying to show alternative ways of conceiving how uh, how basically uh, we came about and how biological diversity exists, etc, etc. But if you kind of get to the core of it, you can actually see that there's a serious issue there, which is that Darwin gives us a theory that really says that, that antagonism and conflict is not some sort of contingent thing that enters into the world of biological creatures, but rather uh, is responsible for the biodiversity that we see today. That there is inherent destruction. I mean, the fact that oil exists uh, means that there isn't so much oil, uh, is an unfathomable amount of death and destruction that has happened just on this little rock. So, um, this is the movement then, in the first seminar I was talking about, from the idea that, oh, there is a contingent antagonism that affects me individually and affects the world to what Hegel calls absolute knowledge, which is not knowledge of everything, but rather an insight into the type of indeterminacy um, or uh, rupture that, that is in reality itself. And as I talked about in that seminar, this is not um, where you don't start with saying that everything is chaos, you start with the law of non-contradiction, you start with the basic laws of rationality, of reason, but it's actually by taking them seriously and going deeply into them that you come to this rock that you smash against. Now, another thing to mention um, 
that I think came out of that first seminar, but is that this isn't simply uh, coming to terms with, okay, there's an antagonism in reality and then we go off and do something else. Uh, it's also an exploration of how this antagonism creates such complexity and, and diversity and that as we come to understand that contradiction in different fields, uh, there's an explosion of fertility. Uh, sciences blow up uh, whenever they are able to positivize this negativity, when they're able to actually bring it into the scientific uh, uh, world. So if you take, for example, the difference between Newtonian science and quantum mechanics, in a Newtonian world, you have the known and you have the unknown. The known is, is basically what we can, in principle, calculate, right? And that's basically everything within the universe. Of course, we'll never get there, but there is a sense in which, in theory, with a big enough mind, enough computing power, enough time, we could, in principle, know everything that is going on within the universe. But there was a limit to that. And the limit was seen as the outside, basically why the laws of nature are the way they are, why the universe exists, right? So there's the known and then there's this unknown. And science basically explores what can be known in principle. Uh, but then with evolution, or sorry, with um, quantum mechanics, you get a different relationship between the known and the unknown. There is the known universe, but the known universe has a type of unknowing that's built into it. Not that's external to it, but that's actually within it. So now the, the, the unknowing is uh, interlaced, interconnected with what is known. And it's not therefore an unknowing that comes from some sort of ignorance, right? So this really in Newtonian science, there's two types of unknowing. There's the stuff that we don't know in actuality, but we could know in principle, right? So that's, the, that's really the unknowing that science deals with in the Newtonian model. It deals with the unknowing that is knowable in principle, but not known in actuality. And then there is the unknowing, which is basically why the universe is structured the way it is. But in quantum mechanics, you still have the first type of unknowing, things that we don't know that we can learn. But the other type of unknowing, which is basically uh, by definition impossible to grasp, uh, but is, it, it, becomes, it becomes part of the scientific endeavor itself. So although it's a type of deadlock or impossibility, it's an impossibility that we can calculate, that we can create probabilities around, and that kind of can increase our understanding of the universe. This is similar to what we've already discussed in the difference between Immanuel Kant and Hegel. For Kant, there is an unknown, which is the noumenal, something which is outside the phenomenal world. So we can know the phenomenal world, but we can't get access to the in itself, to the noumenal. And then with Hegel, he just reorients the noumenal into the phenomenal. There's also a religious dimension to this. Think about it in terms of God as that outside of the universe that created the universe, that gets it going, the absolute other. And then with Christology, the idea that the absolute other is uh, brought into the world, but still remains absolutely other. So Karl Barth talks about this, when like Christ is the revelation of the absolute other as absolutely other. So there's, there's the unknown who, that is outside the universe and then the unknown that exists within. But uh, you can also look at this in relation to love. You know, you know someone and you love them. Uh, there's, there's two types of unknowing. There's the things that you don't know about somebody, maybe their history, their parents, uh, where they grew up, where they went to school. And all of that stuff is in principle knowable. You can get access to that information over time. But then when you really, really love someone, there's a dimension to them which is unknowable in principle. They're not just a mystery to you, they're a mystery to themselves. So you start to know someone as unknowable. You start to see them as, uh, you know, as full of mystery and contradictions and, and, and that you will never grasp them, not just because you don't have enough time, but because they are a type of internal universe. 
right? There's a universe out there and then there's a universe within and they are fragmented. So it's not that in love you suddenly know the person. In love you know the person in their knowability and in their unknowability. So all of those are just different examples of this idea that instead of thinking of um, there is the all, Lacan would talk about there's the all, the stuff that we that can be known or totalized, and then there's the not all, the something that's outside of it. He uses the term non-all, which is a type of saying that a type of uh, a type of unknowing that is within the all. Uh, one other example of this uh, would be from the um, uh, the mathematician. What was his name? Uh, uh, Cantor, who uh, created the idea of transfinite numbers. And the transfinite numbers are, they're kind of infinities that exist within the finite. So between one and two, you can talk about 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. Or between 1.1 and 1.2, you can talk about 1.11 or whatever, right? You can, you can create all of these different densities of infinities uh, that are within the finite. So again, that's just a way of beginning to to grapple with what Hegel's talking about. And all of this creates an incredible, uh, say, fertility within the sciences. Um, I, in this course, have just mentioned three, uh, because those are three areas that I know a fair amount about because of my own area of proficiency. But I've also touched on how we could look at it within biology, within mathematics, within uh, quantum mechanics. I was just meeting with a friend, Scott, uh, the other day, who who's in, uh, in computer science and IT, and he was saying that in his line of work uh, with um, object-oriented programming or object-oriented systems, um, there is a similar notion in which the programmer has to take into consideration uh, the lack, the unknown, um, and the, you know, so I guess there's a whole area within computer programming that, that potentially connects with this. But I stuck with three. And the three that I looked at were subjectivity, so I looked a little bit at Freud, uh, politics, and I think we touched a little bit on Marx and others, and then religion. So in terms of subjectivity, which is the second seminar, we just looked at the idea that the subject um, can't get rid of contradiction because the subject is contradiction. The subject is the result of an explosion of conflicts that are within you at a very basic level. We didn't touch on this, but I'll just mention it. Like the, one of the early um, kind of insights of Freud as he was developing his notion of the subject was he, he started to try to conceptualize the conflicts that were going on in the people he was working with. And one of the things that he saw was the conflict between the id and the id loosely for this can be described as our a kind of a deep primordial emotions let's call it primordial emotions at first our desire to eat to have sex to to to, to be violent to all of these kind of like explosive desires that you see in a child right and it, thankfully they're very weak I mean, if you imagine a child with godlike power we'd all be dead right um i think the twilight zone has played on that i remember the twilight zone where there was this little girl who had godlike abilities and terrorized the family right because there were these explosive desires that were going on within her that she could then you know uh uh, you, uh, force out into the world so if she wanted her parents to stop speaking their mouth would suddenly disappear right so there's that id and then there is the superego the superego broadly can be spoken of as kind of this big other this uh, voice that's an internal external voice like event it starts off externally where you start to realize what you can and can't do in order to fit into the world, in order to have friends, in order to be able to function properly. And that there's this conflict between the id and the superego, and your ego, your sense of self, uh, is the, uh, what erupts as an attempt to manage that conflict between these two parties. <laughs> so really you are the, uh, you arise out of this conflict that needs to be managed in some sort of way. And then at a deeper level, 
you find that the id and the superego are actually intertwined. They're actually interconnected. They kind of need each other. But in this early model, you start to see that uh, the notion of the subject um, is partly the result of, of managing internal conflicts and contradictions. So we looked a little bit at that and then how any kind of self-help thing, anything that's trying to get rid of those contradictions will ultimately fail because it's moving in the wrong direction. Really what we need to do is to confront those contradictions, to work through them and to, in doing that and kind of accepting them, they'll be robbed of their negative power uh, and we'll get to deeper contradictions that are um, uh, less, like that are more productive. So in the next seminar then we looked at this in terms of politics and I looked at how you know, the political landscape is filled with contradictions um, but that what we try to do is we reduce those to oppositions and we create opponents and scapegoats and we make our enemies into something substantial that weirdly um, help us avoid the, the, the conflicts and the contradictions of reality. And so in a, in a line that I got from Dylan Moran, a comedian in, uh, from Ireland, but who did a, a little piece around war being the inability to have conflict. Because when you have a war, it's actually easier. You just kind of say, the other is bad. If we get rid of the other, everything will be better. It unifies us together. And so war, in a sense, is very easy. It's very easy, but it ends up being very, very difficult. It ends up being very destructive. Whereas conflict is very, very hard. Because conflict is where I'm going to enter into a back and forth with you. Uh, not because I think that if I just hear your story, then, you know, then I will know what you're struggling with and we'll become friends. Nothing like that. No, I'll enter into conflict with you thinking you're wrong and, and actually wanting to kind of like really have a go at you in many ways. But with the, with the openness to uh, not knowing where that conflict will go. So the openness to novelty. Not to pr progress in the sense of I know where this is going to go, but rather if we enter into honest co conflict together, uh, something will arise, uh, a kind of compromise solution, right? We'll, something will arise that we'll both um, be unhappy with, but equally, and so we'll be kind of happy with that unhappiness and we'll potentially mean we can move forward. And I think I used the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland as an example of this where the various political parties and paramilitary groups agreed after 30 years of conflict that we needed to have, I say conflict, but let's say 30 years of a kind of a war, to enter into political conflict, to, to go around a table and to see if something could happen, because otherwise we'd end up killing every, you know, we would want to just destroy each other and destroy the economy and like, uh, you know, ensure devastation for everybody in the country. And the result was the Good Friday Agreement. And of course, I love the, the connection between that and obviously the Good Friday, uh, which is this notion of God experiencing the contradiction of God, right? Those people around the table who were agreeing the Good Friday Agreement were experiencing that contradiction. So we looked at that, we looked at scapegoating. Then the next week we went into religion. And I looked at how religion often conceptualizes the universe as we are alienated from the absolute. And that alienation is either an illusion, a veil of illusions that we have to penetrate through, or is some sort of ontologically real event. The, the, um, the alienation we feel is, is real, uh, to do with something to do with a kind of a disruption within the universe, within the absolute. Uh, and the idea is how do we overcome that alienation? Um, and now I want to kind of go deeper into that. Now the first thing you might think is whenever I define, and I said at the beginning of this seminar that I'm interested in religion, um, and my interest is in how do we create communities in which we are able to, uh, let's say, you know, let's say where we are able to um, connect with um, or, 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 or be in sync with the absolute. Um, and then all of what the, the things that come out of that, right? So I'm interested in what does a community look like 
in which we are kind of like we flow with the absolute and what comes out of that type of community how do we remain faithful to that type of community uh, how do we um, strategically create that type of community what is its political outworkings what are its personal outworkings etc etc but when I say that it might sound like I'm repeating the very thing that I was critiquing last seminar which is the idea that religion tends to it's interested in the absolute and I've said I'm interested in the absolute um, in religion you feel alienation and we all feel this alienation to greater or lesser extents not everybody and if you don't feel it it's even worse right um, psychosis uh, so we feel this and then religion in a way is helping you overcome this alienation but that's where the difference is so within parotheology which i'm interested in the parotheological cure uh, which is connected to german idealism which we hegel and is connected to some psychoanalytic insights um, the idea is is that alienation is not the false that we need to penetrate to get to the true alienation is the truth right so the difference if you're kind of trying to parse it out is in uh, confessional religious settings um, you have this notion that the alienation you experience is a type of false veil that he needs to be either ripped through or seen through uh, in order to get to the true whereas what I'm arguing in this course is actually we, we, we end up seeing the alienation as the truth and as we simply embrace the truth of that alienation we redouble it and when we redouble it which is called separation when we redouble the alienation uh, we find freedom right. so that's something we covered a little bit last week but I'm going to go more deeply into it today um, and to do that let's start with uh, i'm just looking at my notes here um okay yeah let's start with this notion of um uh yeah i want to start with something that um that, that freud uh wrote about and actually todd a uh, tad sorry my friend tad delay who's got a book called a god is unconscious really kind of delves into some of this but you know one of the things that freud talked about is that that we internalize the external authority. That's what the superego is in a way. It's the internalization of some external authority. And our, uh, the external authority for Freud in our society came from the father. So the role of the father was to kind of bring the law, to, se to separate the unity of the mother and the child. Now, Freud himself saw these, he was very biologically based, so he was really looking at the biology. After Freud, uh, these became structural issues. So, uh, terms called the name of the father, which means that it's not the biological father necessarily, but there is still a role for someone to, to bring us alienation, right? So, this structure is, uh, there is a type of, in order to... Uh, Kind of navigate the world a type of tyrant exists right the tyrant tells you what you should and shouldn't do and you can't win all the games you're playing and you have to go to bed at a certain time and you have you have to eat your vegetables whatever it is right um, there's a type of tyrant who is making demands on you and imposing law on you and if you don't obey the law there are consequences whether it's being sent to bed early or whatever it is right this is a type of external tyrant and the reason for this tyrant is that you know they are attempting to help you socialize work out how you interact with the world and so the tyranny can be very despotic and bad or it can be you know very helpful right it's kind of saying you have to say you have to say sorry to your sister right um, you have to you know stop eating chocolate or you're going to be up all night right these are these are demands but they're demands that are uh, hopefully to the benefit of the child. Um, now, eventually these commands, these become internal to some extent. And they, you know, so you don't actually literally have to hear them. They're somehow within you. They're, they become part of you. Uh, and then 
Interestingly, whenever your parents die physically, that voice doesn't. That's the trick. So the whole Freudian, one of the Freudian insights is if you're being told by your dad what to do all your life and then your father dies, are you suddenly free to do whatever you want? It's like, no, because that voice is internal. And so it's even worse now because actually maybe your dad isn't like that or isn't like that anymore. And he would say to you, stop, stop doing what I tell you to do. You're a grown adult. You can do whatever you want. You're still my son or you're still my daughter and I'll be proud of you, whatever. But now there's nobody to even say that to you. So now you, all you've got is the voice. And uh, what you have to do is somehow free yourself from that. Because what happens is we define ourselves in relation to this inner voice, whether it's in a positive way or in a negative way. So you can think of people who are always trying to please their authority figures, whether it's their parents or their, the government or the police or whatever it is. And then you know people who are always in opposition to their parents or the government or the police, right? And it's, it's less to do with empirical reasons, right? There are empirical reasons why sometimes you would resist something and sometimes you wouldn't, right? It's kind of almost becomes the lens through which they see. So they define their, themselves for or against this other that is, in a sense, internal to them. And so the next stage is how do you free yourself from that in, uh, internal tyrant who's maybe died externally, but they're internally part of you. And then you enter into freedom, right? Where you're free to, to not be just pushed around by believing there's a substantial other who you either want to die for or die to destroy. Um, and... This, by the way, is part of Freud's initial theory of religion, where he, he postulates in a book, small book called Totem and Taboo, that there are these, way back in history, there are these groups that have a very strong tyrant, somebody who is just stronger than everybody else, who has a, a stronger will and has forced themselves onto the group. Uh, and then Freud postulates that at some point, Everybody in the village is going to start to resent this person. They're going to start to want to rebel against them. And so eventually they kill them. So there is the death of the tyrant. But then Freud says that uh, we can imagine, and by the way, he's, he's structuring this part. It's a mythology in a way. And it's a mythology that he thinks is probably partly to some extent based in reality. But what he's doing is he's structuring this in relation to... Um, the patience that he's seen. Because there's this weird thing in, in analysis where your history is in your present, right? So whenever people talk about living in the present, well, your past is always present. And you can't discover it in its literal sense by looking at the present, but you can kind of discern the lines, the contours of your past through your present. And so Freud is, 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 is kind of like constructing a type of mythology that, that um, is true to the conditions that he sees today. Another way to think of that, by the way, is that, and this is what Immanuel Kant does, is in some ways, whenever a scientist or a philosopher is asking a question, question should be posed a little bit like this, is what conditions are necessary to create the present? So we already live in the present. What conditions are necessary to create the space where the, the present conditions exist. So for example, in epistemology, the study of knowledge, you, you might have someone who's a skeptic who's saying there is nothing that we can know for sure, right? And then you have stoic and you have all these different other positions. Um, and a kind of epistemologist would come in and go, well, what conditions are necessary to create skepticism, right? Because there are skeptics and skepticism can seem like a, a position that one could take. So what, what is required in order for skeptics to exist? Right? And then you start to construct uh, kind of like a, what, what Kant called transcendental categories. And you can kind of know those. So it's a really interesting way of going about things. So Freud is going, like, in order to have the type of people that we have, what, what needed to be in place? So he imagines this external tyrant who's shouting at you, who's telling you what to do, who, who controls all the resources of the village. 
and then they're killed. And then Freud postulates that this death creates guilt um, and also a certain amount of chaos. And so in order to manage the chaos and manage the guilt, a totem is created. And a totem is in a sense the, um, uh, the return of the death of the leader uh, in the community. So now that leader, that tyrant is in some sense within the people and is represented by the totem. And you can see how Freud's beginning to construct this because he's seeing this within the family. You see that the, the child has external tyrants who are telling them what to do. And then eventually they kill the father or the mother, you know, whoever the, the law is, in a sense that they realize that the other is impotent, right? They kind of like, they see through it, they, they rebel against it. Um, but something of that stays within them and is represented in external things around them in their next partner, uh, in who they're attracted to and who they, uh, and how they interact with the world. Um, so, the, oh, what was I going to say about that? The tyrant is internalized. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know if I mentioned this, but um, you know, you notice whenever kids are constantly asking questions of their parents, and often this is interpreted as the child is so inquisitive. Uh, but it, it doesn't often seem like that. Like they're, they're not like, they're just throwing out question after question. Why, 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 why? And um, <coughs> while there's a lot of reasons for that, you know, one of the things you can see sometimes in a child is, is actually it's an attack on the authority of the parent, right? They're eventually, they're, they're not satisfied until they get the parent to go, I don't know, right? So even at a very early age, you start to see this, this dynamic where the child is attempting to break away from, to have alienation from the parents. And part of that is in this struggle to expose the impotency of the other. Um, uh, so that's, that happens in individual families. It's also, as say, Freud begins to think of this as how our, the religious notion of God arises as this internal authority. And a lot of Freud's work with neurotics is an attempt to help free them from this internalized voice that is oppressing them. Because one of the issues with this superego voice is uh, Freud discovers that you can't see it, you can't free yourself from it. It's like a hungry child, like you f the more you feed them, the more they want, right? It's a, it's a, um, and obviously that's not with everybody, but there's, if you have an issue with food, you know, you can't just, the more you eat, the, it, it just, you know, generates more desire. But this is the way that the superego can function for some people is that the more you try to obey it, the more you feel condemned by it. And so you can never be pure enough. You can never be good enough. You can never be right enough. And what happens is you create communities of the superego or communities that eventually consume themselves because uh, the, the demands, the more you give yourself over to the demands, the stronger the demands become, the greater the guilt becomes. And so that's what, just one of the issues. But um, you know, Freud saw that you have to, in a sense, free yourself from this and enter into what can be called love, which is a type of beyond of the law. So um, how does that happen? I'm just gonna outline one way that that occurs within kind of standard analytic uh, session or series of sessions. Um, and then we're gonna apply it to the question of church. So, one way of understanding this is say someone comes to the therapist and they um you know they're feeling guilty they're feeling self-hatred they're overly connected to um, something in their life that's causing them suffering um, at first when you sit down with the analyst you see them as just an expert someone who is trained to help you but they're like a human being just like you and that's called the level of the imaginary. So that's stage one, the imaginary, where really you do see maybe the therapist as an expert, maybe you don't, but at the same time you see them just as a regular person, right? Um, and analysis doesn't really occur at that level, right? But for many people, and if you don't get to this point, you need to find an analyst who you do get to the second level with. The second level is where you enter into the symbolic, and the symbolic can be described as whenever the analyst is no longer just a person like you, they take on a symbolic significance. 
they become a type of screen upon which you project other relationships you have, past and present. Uh, so you, you, you realise that's happening whenever you start to worry about what your therapist will think of you. If you say a certain thing, right? Will they judge you? Will they dislike you? Or when you start to, to want to get their respect, um, you start to kind of like, basically you start to treat them maybe like your mother or your father or one of your siblings or whoever it is. You don't really realize you're doing it, but it's, it's happening. This is transference. Uh, you know, you're, and projection, really, you're projecting, this projection, you're projecting onto the analyst these, these, uh, these other relationships, right? Uh, you're, and also, it's also transference because you're transferring past relationships, past issues into the present in this, in this interaction. And again, it's not really conscious, and the, but the analyst is looking out for it. The analyst is looking at how you're in a transferential relationship with them. They're going like, who am I to the other? Um, what are they playing out? Do they want to evoke my anger? Do they want to evoke my love? Do they want to my respect, my friendship? Uh, do they want to fight against what I want to, what I have to say, or do they want to give themselves over to what I want to say? Right, all of that's happening, um, and then you know analysis starts to become possible. But there's a third stage which can be called the real, and the real, um, in a very practical clinical sense, is whenever the analyst takes up a place within your psychic structure, right? So it's not just that you're projecting onto them certain things, but that you, they start to kind of get a purchase within you. So you start to dream about them. Maybe you're dreaming about your father or your mother, but actually it's them that's in it. So you kind of go, I think it's about my mother, but, but my therapist is in that position. Um, you start to really think about them and see yourself in relation to them. So now it's not just a screen upon which you're projecting stuff. There's something of them and what they're saying that's within you. That's kind of almost like intertwined or interlaced with this superego within you. The difference is the analyst, when they get to that position, they don't manipulate it to try to get you to do what they say now there are some analysts who do they think that's the point the point is to be a strong mother or father for you to help to help you so they maybe do take that position but within the Canadian psychoanalysis you don't you don't use that uh, you in one way you expose the impotence or the death of the internal tyrant so they, the the uh, the therapist is impotent they don't give you advice they don't tell you what you should do they don't really have any insight um, and as you confront that, and as you come to terms with the fact that they don't have any insight or they're not gonna give you any advice, tell you what you have to do so that you can either obey it or disobey it, you start to experience that impotence within your uh, inner tyrant, right? Within the superego, you realize that the superego is also divided, doesn't have the answer. And then that allows you to find distance or freedom from it. Um, so this is a difference between alienation and separation, which we've touched on. Alienation is where I feel separate from the other, and separation is where I realize the other is separate from themselves. So when you kill the tyrant, you're the tyrant, you're alienated from the tyrant, you, you're distant from them, but still the tyrant can have a, a purchase, an anchor within yourself. But then when you experience the impotence of the inner tyrant, you, that's separation, right? That's, that's alienation redoubled. You're not just alienated from the other, the other is alienated from themselves, and you can find a certain freedom. And that looks different in different ways, but I just wanna get that basic structure of the imaginary, there's the therapist, they're an expert in their field, you know, maybe they'll give me good advice about what I should do with my life. To there's a therapist, they are a symbolic representation of some sort of relationship that I start to play out in the analytic session. So actually I start to play out my past in the present to the real. The analyst kind of is within me, this space that they've created, they now are in my kind of fantasy life, they're in my dream life, they're, they're, they're within my psychic structure. 
And when they're within the psychic structure, when they enact their own impotence, their own silence, that um, helps me find, find the desubstantialized nature of the other that's within me. The tyrant that's within me doesn't have the answer, right? They are actually impotent. And that voice that's demanding actually expresses behind it um, something like a, a, a void. Um, okay, so in relation to the church, what, what has this got to do with paratheology and with church community? Um, well, one other thing that I'll mention, because I want to start with this, is that when you go to analysis, you're entering into an agreement. You're trusting that person to some extent that they're going to help you. And there's actually an interview at the beginning, you maybe have a couple of conversations where you know, they find out a little bit about you, you find out maybe a little bit about the process and both of you decide whether you think that this is going to be a productive thing. And at any point you can walk away, right? But that initial interview is just to kind of give you a feel for what's going to happen and for them to hear a little bit about your story. So I want to start there. If you have a community, um, like a church, uh, the people who go to that church have a type of agreement with the people who are running it just by the fact that they're in the place that they're going to. And the agreement is, well, this community is gonna help me get in touch with God, with the absolute. It's gonna help me connect with that deep ground of being in some way. Now, I think it's good for churches and groups to also do a type of interview. Maybe if someone's come along a few times to the community, for someone who is, it, who is leading it, facilitating it, to actually arrange to have a coffee with them, uh, to talk them through what basically the church is doing, just in a very loose way, going, this is what we're attempting to do, this is who we are, to find out more about the people who have been attending, and just to kind of go, right, is this something that feels like it will be a good fit for both of us, right? This is the kind of stuff we're doing, is that what you're looking for? Is that what you're interested in? Um, or is there a place that might be better, right? So you kind of, it, it's it's the... It's, I suppose for some churches it's maybe the membership course can, can be that, but um, not in the way it's usually practiced, but in the sense of going like if you've been at the community for a month or two, you maybe do a four week course where you find out more about what the church is doing and they find out more about you. But whatever it is, that, that's probably an important element um, because this is gonna be, they're trusting you uh, if you're a leader in a community, uh, they're trusting you to enact a theological cure to kind of to do something and um, it's good for them to kind of know basically what you're about and by that I don't mean your mission statement as such in the sense of you know uh, I, I, certain mission statements I'm not a big fan of because they're more like your ideal ego they're saying so as soon as the church says we welcome everybody go like okay why are you saying that who do you not welcome right <laughs> that you have to say it um, and so it's less about that it's more about um, you know, we're a community who are attempting to, um, you know, help people kind of enter into the, say, let's, let's put it in very broad terms, but like, you know, to, to the ground of being, to connect with the deepest part of reality, God, um, and to connect with that part of ourselves. And, you know, this is what we do, and this is what we're interested in, and this is how we do it. Um, and, you know, where, what's your background? You ask the questions, you know, where are you coming from? What's your religious background? What are you hoping to achieve? From coming to this community because if they're coming to the community they want something from it uh, you have that conversation then once that's kind of agreed and I say it's a tacit agreement you don't have to go into everything that you're going to do the analyst doesn't tell you everything about their training they couldn't but once you and they decide that this could be useful and they start to come along to the community the first thing that happens is potentially they look at the church and the structure, the liturgical structure, and they see a pile of people just like them, just experts, people who have maybe done training, who know how to sing, know how to preach, uh, know the Bible, etc., etc. And that's kind of the imaginary. And they sit there and they listen and they go, oh, that's an interesting sermon about how I should be nicer to my neighbor, right? That's fine. That's all okay. But that's not getting to... Uh, the role of the church. Yeah, that's nowhere near the role. That's just kind of a liberal kind of like uh, the church is there to teach you how to be nice to your, your uh, shopkeeper or whatever, right? Uh, or to tithe or to uh, recycle or whatever it is, right? So 
But the second level, and this is why in a sense a church should be slightly otherworldly, right? And it is kind of otherworldly. It's a bizarre kind of place. Even, even churches that are low um, in terms of their structure, you know, have like a certain a pew and, uh, or an altar and uh, chairs in certain style. And, you know, they have a certain liturgical thing, which is different from everyday life. And then other churches go to that in a very, very theatrical way. But the second thing is then the symbolic, is without realising these people who have had a meeting with you, uh, you've agreed that this might be useful, and they're coming along, they start to see the liturgical structure, the, the, the music, the prayers, the sermon, um, as a type of, they, they basically, they project onto that their notion of God. Let's put it that way. They start to transfer their notion of God onto that structure. They start to project their relationship with God onto that structure. So there's now interesting dynamic. That's the second level, the symbolic. Um, and at a very deep level, what a person does is they tend to put onto the liturgical structure the religious notion of God as an absolute unity, a wholeness, a completeness that um, can promise that we can get rid of our alienation and uh, help us kind of like uh, become whole, right? That's just happening. And in the same way they're doing that within capitalism or whatever, with consuming products or within their workplace and thinking if they, they work hard enough or they're trying to please their government or they're trying to please their family. They're doing it in all walks of life, all these different walks of life. They're, they're kind of like, uh, there's big others who they, who are who's dictating and who are dictating to them how they should live. And often, as I say negatively, they're fighting against them. But in the church then, all of those small gods that, that are kind of dictating how you live get put onto the liturgical structure. Because that's God, that's the absolute on the liturgical structure. That's not you know, consumerism, that's not your government, that's not your family. This is the, the, the uh, source of the universe, right? So it's kind of like there's all the little gods that are around in a Neil Gaiman kind of universe. And then, bam! You go on a Sunday morning to the ultimate big other who offers the wholeness that you're seeking in all these other different ways. And that's great. The point is you allow that transparency to happen, right? Just as the analyst allows it to happen, like the difference between, say, a counsellor and an analyst, a counsellor might say, listen, I'm not your mother, right? I'm not your father, you know, but they might try and stop that. But an analyst encourages it. They want all of that projection of... Uh, that they, where they become um, some part of yourself that you can't look at and transference where you're taking you're transferring emotions and relationships from elsewhere onto them and by the way that, that's a good way I'm using these two words very inter, in an interchangeable way and that's not right so projection in a way is where I put out onto you something with, within me that I'm not looking at so I might go I know what you're thinking you're thinking I'm bad, you're thinking I'm an asshole, right? No, you're thinking you're an asshole, right? But you can't admit that to yourself, so you put it out onto somebody else as they're judging me in this way. Now, they might be judging you in that way, and you might just be making a, a, an empirical point, but when it becomes projection is whenever you start to put your kind of disavowed elements of yourself and your, your view of yourself onto the other, right? So that's projection. Transference is where you take other relationships from elsewhere and you transfer them into the setting so um, and those are those are part of what's encouraged within the analytic setting so in this in this couple let's use it as a couple who have started to come to your church very gradually they start to um, transfer their notion of the big other this wholeness is God onto the structure and they project um, disavowed aspects of themselves onto that so I guess an example of that would be uh, God is judging me you know God I God God hates what I how I'm living my life right or um, uh, you know God um, is judging me or something like that so in one sense you're maybe you're guilty yourself or you're judging yourself but you put it onto the liturgical structure now this is the key moment right this is where the all of the action is what do you do at this point? Um, at this point, uh, there's two ways to go, right? 
One way is for the liturgical structure to take that on and to affirm it, right? Just like an analyst could take all of that stuff on and, and affirm it and then become your father or your mother, become that kind of figure, right? Um, like a type of guru. But the other is that you take that on so that you can break it, not so that you can harness it in, you know, in, in to, you know, so the guru becomes the new leader, right? But the liturgical structure takes all of that on, allows that to happen so that it can free you from this notion called the death of God. So the role of the church is to enact the death of God. And this is the third level, the real, is there's a certain point in which the liturgical structure isn't just what I, I project those disavowed elements of myself onto the structure. God is judging me, God hates me, or God is uh, you know, uh, angry at me. Um, and not just transparency, where, where the liturgical structure becomes the absolute embodiment of all of the little gods that I'm kind of fighting with or giving myself to in my daily life, right? Um, it's that it gets inside us. Uh, as you sing the songs, as you say the prayers, in the very repetition, this stuff becomes part of you. As you listen to the sermons, they, they kind of like hook into you, they anchor into you. And then, at that point, you can make a really interesting change because when in the liturgical structure, there are hymns of doubt and unknowing, there are sermons about the self-alienation of God, there are prayers that, that express this, that isn't just something you're listening to, that is actually changing um, your inner experience of the big other. You are undergoing and experiencing the death of God, the crucifixion of Christ, which is part of the, sal the salvatory event, right? Is that you undergo the crucifixion so that you can enter into the resurrection. Um, and you don't, you're not doing this consciously. Uh, it's not something that you're necessarily aware of, it's, but it's happening to you and within you. Um, and it can only happen as a liturgical structure moves from the imaginary into the uh, symbolic, into the real. Now, one service where this happens doesn't do very much, but if this continues to happen week on week for over 20 years, it changes things so that you experience this rupture and that affects all the little gods in your life. You start to be free from the frenetic pursuit of some job or some person or some product that will fix everything. And you shift your very way you libidinally invest and interact with the world. And you become disinvested, you become subtracted from a form of being in the world and you enter into a new way of being in the world, right? And that new way of being in the world is a freedom from the frenetic pursuit of something that will make you whole and complete in all areas of your life because it's happening with, within the church. That's the, for me the role of the church is to enact the death of God so that it transforms your way of being immersed in the world in general, a radical subtraction. The trash of the world, as Paul calls it, the, or Luther calls it the excremental remainder, right? You know, um, that's why I call the church this countercultural collective, which is disinvested from the pursuit of a lost object that will make you whole. Right? That kind of, <laughs> that's kind of the rule. It's like you're free to pursue your happiness, but this is freedom from the pursuit of happiness. Freedom to experience the struggles of life. And as that's reflected in the liturgy, it gets reflected in you. So I want to give you one concrete example, and then I'll finish up. One concrete example is a service I did uh, with others in Belfast called Sins of the Father. And just give you the very basic structure. It was in a place called the Menagerie. It was late at night. The Menagerie is this bar. It's very grungy. We did a lot of icon gatherings there. As you walked in, uh, as often happened, you know, we had a DJ who was playing music. And they were doing this music. And over the top of it were these Bible verses. Just that when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? When I was in prison, did you visit me? So just echoing through the music were these lines. And as people got settled and had a drink and whatever, that eventually dimmed. And uh, I got up and I told a parable and I said, at the end of days, all humanity are brought before the judgment seat. 
and the book is opened, the book of life. Uh, and then all of humanity look within the book of life to see if God's name is written there. And they say in one voice to God, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? When I was in prison, did you visit me? And then after that, there was some poetry that was based on um, uh, a passage from a book called Yossel Rakover Talks to God, about, which is a beautiful piece of um, uh, kind of literature that came out of the Holocaust about a wrestling with God. Um, there was, you know, some music. And then there was a point where we wrote down on little fragments of paper times where we felt God had sinned against us. Right? You know, I was honest and I was robbed. The person I love left me. I had a child and she died. You know? uh, I have a terminal illness uh, and I haven't told anybody. Whatever it was, like really, like whenever you ask people to write something down in a room, and part of the reason for doing that is you're sensitized to all of the struggles within the room. It's, it, it's amazing to feel like how much um, suffering is around you. You can be in a room of 50 people, you're all having a drink and chatting and having a good time. But in that kind of environment, people write stuff down. And they didn't, if they folded it and put an X on it, we didn't read it out. But if they just wrote, we collected all the pieces and we began to read them. And so you start to go, oh my goodness, all of the struggles that are in this room, past and present, that people are fighting with. And as we read them out, we had broken wine glasses all over the, the bar and we poured red wine into the broken wine glasses. So as you were hearing these uh, kind of like uh, uh, claims, these, uh, what would you call them, protests to God, you were just seeing these wine glasses fill with wine, but because they were broken, all spilling out onto the tables and dripping onto the floor, right? And as we read them out, we put them in a fire, a holy fire that was sending smoke up and out. And the idea was these, this is the aroma, this is we're sending the smoke up to God for you to smell. We want, we want you to inhale these. Yeah. And what we then did is at the end, again, there was a, some poetry by, by Padre Gutuma, and uh, we finished, everyone got a little Tamagotchi, those 1980s little key rings where you create a creature and you have to feed it. Right? And then there's a reflection on that how we create things that then make demands on us. Um, and that was it. Now, the thing is about that service is in a way any church could do it, right? Up to a point, right? But at the point at which you kind of like make these claims about God sinning against you, the move at the end of a confessional church would either be, you know, damn, well, that's how you feel and it's good to express that, but God is not guilty of that. Um, and you know, yeah, well, one one is able to express that, uh, or it's, you know, you might get the idea of you can overcome this. You know, we'll pray for you, we'll help you, and you know, we can we can get over it. This service was simply containing all of that. It wasn't trying to give an answer to it. It was it was creating a liturgical structure that allowed for and kind of like rose those struggles to the level of um, where the. I don't, I don't want to say they were kind of sublimated or anything, but I want to say like we created a liturgical structure that could contain all of that anxiety and all of that suffering without putting a lid on it, without giving it an answer. Because in a way, where change happens is if there's too much anxiety, you can't make change, right? If someone is so worked up about something, you can't do anything, right? You have to take it down a little bit. But if someone has no anxiety, say for example, they're, they're medicating with alcohol or with a relationship, sex or whatever, then it's very hard to get anything done, right? Because the medication is stopping them from feeling a certain level of anxiety that can make a change. The trick is how do you create a space that can bring the anxiety of the room up without it going out of control? How can you, through the liturgical structure, the art, the music, the words, the prayers, the poems, create a structure that can raise, can, can expose the anxiety, but in a way that doesn't become too much? And in the sins of the Father, the idea, of course, is that, oh, all of this suffering and all of this difficulty is held within the absolute itself. 
That's kind of the underlying kind of message that is very subtly being said. Now you go to that one service like that, not much happens. You might have a good time, you might not. But if you are undergoing that type of structure, weekly or monthly, over time, that does begin to change your understanding of the absolute at an existential level. And it helps you come to terms with the contradictions and the deadlocks that are within your life and within society. And it does help you libidinally disinvest from this frenetic pursuit of the whole and the one. And this freedom from that pursuit is folded into the absolute itself. So you're actually, and one way that a church can do this is they try to, and, and I'm talking about at any gathering, what a community that you're part of, is each gathering has an element of that, right? Just a little tiny element of it. But maybe over the course of a whole year, there's an arc that's moving towards this, this idea of bringing people into the crucifixion and through to what's beyond the crucifixion, which is the, the collective of the Holy Ghost, right? Now, every time you take Eucharist, there is this element, the sacred God, who is then internalized um, and consumed and disappears. And then the third movement, which is you are the body of Christ in the world as you love and care for one another. So we, the Eucharistic event, uh, literally ritual, I think captures this in a very, very powerful way. And uh, we've lost that a little bit, but I think that's within the very nature of the, uh, the act. So that is what I'm talking about in terms of the role of the church. Because we have to ask what it is. I mean, it's not just a social event. It's not just a, you know, try to make you a nicer person. It's not, it's not about kind of like, a, you, know, um, you know, any specific political agenda or anything like that. It can have all of those dimensions, right? It can include them in a contingent way. But what is the necessary point of a paratheological community? And the necessary part of a paratheological community is to get to the point where it can enact this death of God within the congregation so that they are libidinally disinvested from this frenetic pursuit. This is why I've often said the good news of Christianity is not that you can be whole and complete, because that's actually bad news, makes you feel more anxious and why am I not complete? It causes scapegoating, oppositional thinking and the fantasy of a non castrated other. Rather the good news of Christianity is you're not whole, you're not complete, you don't have the answers. You go like, how can that be good news? Well, when you understand that at a deep level, that is great news because you're freed from this frenetic pursuit, free to be, and that is where the absolute is because as you embrace that, you experience Christ experiencing the absence of God. That's the redouble the alienation. It's not that you feel separate from God, it's that God feels separate from God. And as you feel that separation within yourself, you uh, are standing with Christ. This is why Mother Teresa is interesting to me. Not Mother Teresa in terms of her acts, many of which were good, some of which were not so good. Um, it's Mother Teresa's religious experience where she uh, went from the place of in her, in her teens experiencing um, this uh, giving up everything for God and then experienced later on in her life, and it was in her 30s, the, the, give, the giving up of everything, including God, the loss of everything, including God. And she experienced this loss of God. But what happened after that is that in that very loss of God, she enacted God. It was, that was her deepest spiritual experience, was the loss of God became a positive experience. And um, so in a, in a way, I think Mother Teresa's religious experience is a good example of how this looks. And um, with that, I wonder if there's anything else I just wanted to say. There was one other thing I, that was on the back of my mind. Um, so I just think, uh, Mother Teresa, the good news, and the, the good news that life is incomplete. Um, the idea that as you get to the end of that, you find freedom. I guess, well, um, I guess one thing again by this is then, once you've undergone this experience, uh, in a way that's, that's church over. The only thing being is that maybe to a certain extent we can always have reversals, we can always be you know, unfaithful to this event. And so actually then once you've gone through the event, the role of church after that is, is one, to 
help you remain faithful to that and two, to give yourself over to helping other people undergo the journey. So at the end of this experience within a power of theological community of disinvestment, uh, you give yourself over to then helping the next couple that come along and then interviewing them and then helping them go through the imaginary, the symbolic and the real. And you maybe attend occasionally because you want to remain faithful to that event in yourself. Uh, so that, in a way, is absolute knowledge for Hegel. Um, that's the cure within um, psychoanalysis and within theology, and power theology, that's called salvation. And um, I hope some of you are part of communities that are in attempting to enact that. And uh, 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 we need each other because we're going to have to, you know, I want to see more and more communities that have this kind of this vision, this vocation. and. Um, and I think that that is the next iteration of church. All right, thanks for listening. Take care. Bye-bye.